Welcome to another edition of the Law and Gospel Devotional. My name is Eric Sorensen, and each week we gather with you to look at God's two words, both his word of law, which tells us all that we are supposed to do and points out the many ways in which we have fallen short. And more importantly, most importantly, his word of gospel, which ultimately points us to all that God has done for us and our salvation through the person and work of Jesus Christ. This week, we are back in 1 Corinthians. Specifically, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. That means last time we were in chapter 9, where Paul was talking about, oh, kind of all the things that he sought to do in order to reach people with the gospel. He says to the Jews, I became like a Jew, to the wolves under the law, I became like those under the law, to those without the law, namely Gentiles, I became like one without the law. And why did he do it? He says, I sought to be all things to all people so that I might win some. And then at the end of the chapter, some might argue it actually is probably meant to go into chapter 10. He says, I do all these things. I run, I compete, I work hard. So I would not end up disqualifying myself. And that leads us into our passage today in which Paul is going to detail how it was that the nation of Israel so often went about disqualifying themselves by their behavior, by ultimately their unbelief and their idolatry. So let's go ahead and dive into our passage today. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. That's really all about battling temptation and by extension, really on not being an antinomian, not taking the grace of God for granted, not taking one's position based on what God has done for them, for granted in their lives and thus worshiping false gods, create, uh, worshiping idols and doing all manner of wickedness and evil. There's a story from the Civil War about uh, a leader of a platoon named John Sedgwick who, uh, seeking to motivate his troops, stood up on a hill uh, near, near the front lines of a battle between the Union and the South. And as he was speaking, one of the soldiers that he was speaking to said, Sir, you better duck because I think the Union Army could hit you if you're not careful. And Cedric, being very cocky and very arrogant about his position, said, They couldn't hit an elephant from this distance. And before he could even finish the word distance, they indeed did hit him. And when I heard that story, it reminded me of the nation of Israel, uh, a nation that had received incredible, abundant provision from God, incredible grace from God, and indeed incredible salvation from God. And yet, because of their position, or maybe a failure to recognize their position more accurately, they end up really upsetting God and causing all manner of problems for them and for their fellow Israelites. And this all leads to something that I think is true as we talk about battling temptation today, and that is that Christianity teaches that there is not sinlessness for the Christian. The Bible is very clear about that in Romans chapter 7, Galatians chapter 5 most specifically, where what's depicted for us there is the raging battle that goes on between the flesh and the spirit in the believer's life. But uh, so there, it doesn't teach that there's going to be sinlessness, but in fact, the best way of sort of describing the Christian life is actually one of struggle, one of trial, one of temptation, one of uh, endurance and difficulty. And we ought to acknowledge that up front as we talk about what Paul's going to say today in 1 Corinthians 10, because it seems that the nation of Israel, rather than accepting that the Christian life would be one of struggle between the flesh and the spirit decided to go with the antinomian option, if we want to call it that, which was to disregard God's law entirely and see no use for it in their lives. We see abundant evidence for that all the time. And we don't want to do that, even though we know that we are not saved by our law keeping or we're not saved by our obedience. Nevertheless, the law has a very important role in our lives, as we've already depicted at the very beginning of this devotion. So what does Paul say we need to do in order to battle temptation? Well, the first thing he's going to tell the Corinthians and us by extension is that we ought to remember the past by looking back to our brothers and sisters in the nation of Israel. He says, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. 
essentially what Paul is saying here is he references them as being examples for us to look to both here and in verse 12 of our passage is the, the same thing that we've heard here attributed to Winston Churchill, that those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And indeed, there's a lot of commonality between what the nation of Israel had experienced in their abundant provision from God and what Christians experience. Uh, Israel was guided by the Spirit. So too are Christians. They were guided by the Spirit through the wilderness, by a pillar of fire and a cloud. We are told later, indeed, that that is the Spirit's presence with them. We're told that they were baptized. That's what Paul refers to their experience in the Red Sea as. He calls it a baptism. And what happened in the Red Sea? Well, they were delivered from their enemies. They were delivered from their captors. They were delivered from their bondage into new life. They were actually saved through those waters. Yes, indeed. And indeed, they were fed supernatural food or what Keith Green refers to in his single So You Want to Go Back to Egypt they ate manna burgers. They had angels' food falling from the sky. It was delivered to them. And so, too, Christians also are fed supernatural food, as it were, when we partake in the Lord's Supper, receiving the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. And just like the nation of Israel that drank the water of life from the rock, we, too, receive the water of life from Christ, who ultimately is the rock. And so we have all these things in common. All of these things are gifts of God to us, gracious gifts to us for our salvation and for our good. And yet the nation of Israel squandered it. And so we read in verse five, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, why was that? Well, what did they do? Well, we know what they did, right? When Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and the law from God, well, his brother Aaron goes about making a golden calf and all the people follow him in worshiping that golden calf. And it doesn't get any better throughout the whole time in the wilderness and really throughout all of Israel's history. They're filled with complaints and laments and longing for the good old days back in Egypt longing for the days where they had garlic, leeks, and onions. And so God is not pleased with them because they do not have any appreciation for the gifts they've received. They disregard his gifts and disregard him in the process as not being worthy of their praise and thanksgiving. And indeed, the Apostle Paul wants to warn the Corinthians that they may be headed down that same path because the Corinthians have shown evidence of this all throughout the letter. If you've been following along, you've seen them taking advantage of their neighbors. You've seen them doing things that aren't in congruity with true worship of God. And yet they're doing it under the guise of grace. They're saying, well, you know, we've been saved by grace, so who cares? And that is improper. That is not what we are to do. And indeed, it put their souls in danger to have that kind of attitude. They're failing to recognize the struggle that they have entered into as Christians. Yes, indeed, this is why Luther says at the beginning of his 95 Theses that all of the Christian life is one of repentance each and every day. That doesn't mean sinlessness, but it does mean struggle. And if we forget that or we take it for granted, then we get into all sorts of danger. There's a great parable in Matthew 18 that emphasizes this about a man who's forgiven the equivalent of billions and billions of dollars by his master. And what does he do with that wonderful forgiveness of all of his debts? Well, he finds somebody out on the street that owes him a few bucks and decides to choke him out until that man can pay him the few bucks back. Indeed, that's, that is what the Corinthians are being warned against. You've been forgiven so much, how can you not extend forgiveness to the other is the point of the parable in Matthew 18. And the same thing is going to apply to the Corinthians. And in fact, the context is going to have Paul eventually rebuking the Corinthians for taking advantage of their poor brothers and sisters, even at the Lord's table. And so we don't want to take advantage of the grace of God, even though we always do it by one way or another in thought, word, or deed. We want to recognize that that sin that needs to be repented of and indeed needed to be died for by Jesus Christ. That's the point. It's struggle. So we battle temptation by remembering what happened in the past, but we also battle temptation by 
well, it's all connected, humbling ourselves by being humble enough to recognize that we don't have it all figured out. As a matter of fact, the biggest problem for us is when we think we do. That's why the Apostle Paul says in verse 12, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Yes, pride goeth before the fall. And so the problem, folks, is not assurance per se. The problem is self-assurance. And ultimately, I'm going to tell you that every time, quote unquote, antinomian ha- oh, antinomianism happens, every time legalism happens, they're really two sides of the same coin. It is always self-assurance that is the problem. They are false gospels. They are ways of us trusting in ourselves or our own works for being enough rather than the pure gospel that is given to us by Jesus Christ, our Lord. I've been here before, not in, uh, not, uh, well, I'll tell you a short story. When I was a teenager, I was invited to go up and speak on stage at this concert. And there was a lot of people at the concert that, that were sort of egging me on to do it and were eager to see me get up and say something. They thought I'd say something funny or entertaining. And I got to tell you, I was puffed up beyond belief getting up on that stage because people were, were excitingly pushing me up there. And so I thought I was going to crush it. And then I got behind the microphone and for the first time ever heard my voice behind a microphone, just heard the slightest breath come out of my mouth into the mic and immediately got stage fright like the boy in our photo here. Why did that happen? Well, I'm convinced because I went up there proud and arrogant and I got humbled. Indeed, God is faithful to us, folks, and part of his faithfulness to us is that when we do get proud like the nation of Israel did, he will humble us and it won't be pleasant. It's not pleasant to be humbled and yet it's so essential for us to recognize our place all the time. Indeed, that's really just another way of saying we need Christ assurance, not our own assurance. Christ assurance freely confesses struggles and stands on him as our solid rock in spite of our wobbly, wobbly ways. And this is really what the nation of Israel had forgotten to do. They no longer saw God as worthy of their time to lean on and to worship and to depend on. And indeed, that is always the problem for us. And it will, I guarantee you, lead to the problems that the Corinthians were having in their church. No, instead, we ought to find our strength through dependence. Again and again and again, I say this all the time in the podcasts that I make and in the videos that I make, the Christian life finds its strength not through independence, but through dependence. We ought to see ourselves like the Apostle John at the Last Supper who just leans on the shoulder of his Lord because it is there when we lean and where we realize our only strength is found in him that we will be able to battle the various temptations and struggles and trials that come our way. As Paul famously says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, there's a few things here that we're told about enduring temptation that are really, really important to remember. First of all, remember you are not alone when you go through the temptations that inevitably will come in your life and the trials that inevitably will come in your life. And they will, I promise you, remember that you're not alone. Brene Brown says the two most powerful words when we're in struggle are me too. So often when we face the difficulties of life, we feel like we're all alone. We're not Indeed, the Apostle Paul says, no temptation has come upon you that isn't common to human beings. Everybody's dealing with this kind of stuff. And even if they haven't dealt with the exact issue you have, they indeed have faced trial. Don't believe for a second the lie that you're the only one. You're not. There's plenty, plenty of others that have gone through it. And there's strength in finding out out that you're not alone in this battle battle. 
that we deal with throughout our Christian lives. Secondly, remember that God is faithful to you. That's what the Apostle Paul says here. He's faithful to you in your temptation, and he won't let you be tempted beyond your ability. Now, that's not saying that God will never give you more than you can handle. Yes, he will, but there's a reason for that, so that you will learn to depend on him. Again, finding your strength in dependence. As 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then I love what he says in the very next verse. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. How do you battle temptation? remembering that God is the one who will bring you to the other side. He'll bring you through it. And yet it's very important to remember that you are going to go through it. You're just not going to go through it alone because you have the Lord of heaven and earth and he is actually your escape. And so remember, God will give you a way out, but it is not a way out with ease. Rather, the wording here is very interesting in verse 13. It is a way of escape to be able to endure it. The word for endure there is to, to bear it up, but you don't bear it up. Christ bears it up. Bring all your anxieties to him. Bring all your trials to him. Bring all your struggles to him. He will bear you up. He will give you the endurance to be able to go through whatever struggles may come your way. Now, don't do what the nation of Israel did by seeking to find an answer outside of the true and living God, seeking to find an answer outside of his presence. No, the answer comes from the one who was crucified and risen from the dead for you and for your justification. Again, remember the words of 1 Thessalonians 5. He is faithful to sanctify you completely. He will surely do it. Yes, if you're going to endure any of the struggles and strife and temptations and trials that come your way in this life, folks, if you're going to go through the struggle instead of going the antinomian option, which is just to disregard God or just to disregard the need to hear what his word says to you, then, folks, you're going to need to look over and over and over to the reality of who God says you are in Jesus Christ. You have been crucified with Christ, the scripture says in your baptism. You have been raised to new life with Christ, the scripture says in your baptism in Romans chapter 6. This is who you are, and this is what will give you the ability to endure the crosses that will inevitably come in your life because he who has endured the true cross for your salvation has already completed his work and will bring you through it to the end. It's not and if, it's just a when. It is a promise. He will accomplish it. And that is our hope that will get us through. As Hebrews chapter 4 says in closing, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Notice he says, don't, he doesn't say go to the throne so that you might find advice. Go to the throne so that you might be able to be uh, better at your life. No, no, go to the throne because you need grace and mercy to find help in time of need. Well, how many times of need do you have, dear Christian? The answer is all the times. And so, yes, what it looks like to endure the temptation and the trials and the struggles is to look to God for mercy and grace, not just once, not just twice, but all the time in our lives. And indeed, it is through his grace that he will give you the power to endure. All right, that's it for this week's Law and Gospel Devotional. I hope you've been encouraged by that. May God richly bless you, and we will see you next week.